Welcome to the Names and Attributes of God, Part 5. Last time we began looking at God, our protector and our stronghold, and we had four different names of God that we had put in this grouping. We looked at the first three back then, and I'm going to just name them for you once more before we go on to the next. The first one is Yahweh Tsuri, the Lord my rock. Then there's Yahweh Makti, the Lord my refuge. And Yahweh Mutsi, the Lord my fortress. Let's now go on to the last one. The word deliverer has a number of meanings, but when we look at it applied to God, the synonyms are the same. Save, rescue, set free, liberate, release, set at liberty, set loose, extricate, and it goes on and on. <clears throat> the Bible speaks of God who is our deliverer, Jehovah Mephalti, M-E-P-H-A-L-T-I, Mephalti. A variation of this name is Adonai Mephalti, my Lord, and that's lowercase Lord, my deliverer. Psalm 18, verse 2, the Lord Jehovah is my rock and my deliverer, Mephalti. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. What wonderful descriptions of God who is our deliverer. Psalm 40, verse 17 says, since I'm afflicted and needed, let the Lord be mindful of me. You are my help and my deliverer, Jehovah Mephalti. Do not delay, oh my God. Can you think of people in the Bible <clears throat> who were delivered in a miraculous way? Well, how about Daniel from Lyons? Joseph, he was a slave and he became uh, second in command in the greatest country in the earth. Moses and the people of Israel who in, were enslaved for 400 years and freed. Gideon, his, and his army from the Midianites with trumpets and chars and torches. Elijah from way, wild pagan prophets and King Ahab and Jezebel who were chasing him. <clears throat> Peter delivered from prison. David delivered from the giant Goliath and the King Saul. It was David who wrote Psalm 18 and 2 Samuel 22. So he had some experience with being delivered. I guess the question we should ask ourselves is, what do I need to be delivered from? Well, ultimately, sin and the wrath of God on my sin. Romans 5 verses 9 and 10 says, Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall also be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were sinners, were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Let's talk for a moment about the wrath of God. A world does not want to think about a God who's anything but love. But love is just a part of who God is. All of God's character is holy and pure. His love is holy and pure. And his wrath is not just anger or a hissy fit or a temper tantrum. It too is holy and pure. So what is the wrath of God for? Why is he so angry at us and wants to judge rain, rain judgment down on us? Romans 1.18 says, speaks about the unbelief and its consequences. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. What does it mean to be ungodly? <clears throat> what is ungodliness? Well, the Bible talks about the ungodly is those who are separated from God. Ungodliness is the condition of being polluted with sin. God is perfect and holy and cannot abide sin, and he cannot be in the presence of sin. So to be ungodly is to act in a way that is contrary to the nature of God. It means to intentionally oppose God <clears throat> by disobedience or to have a bold disregard for God. This includes ignoring God or acting in a way that doesn't give him his rightful place as king of our lives. That's sin. <clears throat> Ultimately, those who reject God, the ungodly, will be separated from him forever. 
It says in Revelation 20, verse 15, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Like I said, we like to emphasize the love of God and underplay the justice of God. It was because of his great love for rebellious mankind that Jesus sacrificed himself to provide payment for our sin. God's love and justice go hand in hand. We cannot just pick and choose the attributes that we like and deny the others. <clears throat> God is perfect and holy and loving and pure, and he's just, and so much more. It's a complete package. John three seventeen. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 1 John 4, 9, by this the love of God was manifested in us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. Romans 5, verse 6 and verse 8 says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time, God died for the ungodly. What a marvelous fact. God must judge sin wherever he sees it, but he loves us so much that he sent his only son to be our deliverer, Jehovah Mephalti, to pay the penalty and give us the opportunity to escape that holy judgment, to be adopted into his family and to have fellowship with God, of the God of the universe forever. Romans 5 verse 8, but God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God justifies the ungodly. Then he enables us to live as we ought to and follow his promises. He, then he, asks, he tells us that he, we will have an eternal home in heaven. He did it all. We do nothing except receive it, receive it in repentance, the work that's already been completed for us by the Son of God, by our deliverer, Jehovah faulty. Colossians 1 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus, my deliverer, Jesus, Jehovah Mephalti. He paid for my sin. He brought me salvation. He stood in my place so I could be justified and saved from the wrath of the almighty God. That's justification. Then he enables me to be transformed. That's transformation. And he promises me a place in a home in heaven for eternity. That's relocation. And he enables me to live in a manner right now that is pleasing to God. That's sanctification. I would call that a great deal. He did absolutely all of us, all of it. And all I have to do is say yes to Jesus and let him be Lord of my life. Jehovah Mephalti delivers me from the penalty of my sin, the power of my sin and the presence of sin in my life, both for now and for eternity. This is no small thing. Romans 6, 1 to 7 tells me that when I am in Christ, I am identified with him in his life and in his death, and sin has no more power or control over me. Jehovah Mephalti delivers me from the power and control of my inborn sinful nature what shall we say then are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase may it never be how shall we who died to sin still live in it or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death therefore we've been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the father so we too might walk in newness of life for if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is free from sin. Remember, sisters, our position in Christ has delivered us from the judgment of eternal death. Now as we walk with Christ um, as believers, he offers us deliverance from the control of that sinful nature. It's practically. And just as our coming to Christ in salvation was voluntary, our consent and submission to him as we walk through this life is voluntary too. It really is the fruit of our salvation. 
If there's no fruit or desire for fruit, then perhaps there was no original rep rep repentance in the first place. Therefore, there's no salvation. Jesus himself tells us in Matthew 7, 19 to 21, a good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Ladies, we are told not to judge. <clears throat> that is, judge the unbeliever, because God will do that. They are already under that judgment, but we are told to be fruit inspectors, to discern, not for the purpose of lording it over or raising ourselves up, but to recognize a true believer by their actions, the fruit of the Spirit they display, Galatians 2.20. Again, this is not so we can look down our spiritual noses at another, but rather so we can encourage and make certain that that person really does know Jesus and doesn't just think she knows Jesus. I would hate to, for someone to be standing before Christ at the judgment seat and say, well, Beth Fast said that I was a Christian. We need to share the gospel to all and look for that fruit <clears throat> when one possesses professes that she knows Jesus as her Lord and Savior. Frankly, it's really not, not hard to see if someone truly believes or not. Our sanctification, that's becoming more like Christ in our daily walk, is progressive. That is, even though we are saved, we're delivered from sin and justified in Christ, we sometimes still act in ungodly ways. <clears throat> Let's admit it. We are still in the process of, of being transformed into his image, Romans 8, 29 and 30, and 2 Corinthians 3, 18, and Philippians 1, 6, all say those things. We're declared righteous before God, but we're still being made holy in a practical sense and in practical terms. In short, we still sin. Scripture says we should confess our sins and trust God's forgiveness, 1 John 1, verse 9. Nothing can separate me from God's love in Christ. Romans 8, 31 to 39. We are no longer numbered among the ungodly, even though we still fight our fleshly urges and sometimes act in ungodly ways. The heart of the gospel is that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And his payment covers all who repent and come to him. And that is how he's my deliverer how he's your deliverer. Why not pause for a moment and think about that? Think about what has God delivered me from? Why not praise him now for the deliverance and freedom he bought for you and me through his death on the cross? Finally today, let's look at one more name or descriptive word that goes along so well with the truth about Jehovah Mephalti, our deliverer. It's found in John 10, verses 7 to 9, in the parable of the Good Shepherd. So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear him. them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. <clears throat> what does he mean when he says, I am the door? Well, gotquestions.org explains it this way, and I'll just read what they have to say. <clears throat> the statement, I am the door, found in John 10, 7, is the third of seven I am de declarations of Jesus recorded only in John's gospel. These I am proclamations point to his unique divine identity and purpose. In this I am statement, Jesus colorfully points out for us the exclusive nature of salvation by saying that he is the door, not a door. Furthermore, Jesus is not only our shepherd who leads us into the sheepfold, but he is also the door by which we may enter and be saved. Jesus is the only means we have of receiving eternal life, John 3:16. There is no other way. So well put. It's helpful to remember that facts about sheep, <clears throat> they're followers. 
and they are kind of naive, if not a little simple-minded. Apparently, they can spend the whole day nibbling on grass and never look up. Suddenly, they finally look up and they don't know where they are, and they don't know how they got there. And they're not like a dog or a horse who has kind of a homing instinct and can find their way back to where they began. Also, by nature, sheep are followers. If the lead sheep steps off a cliff, the others will follow. There are other sheepy qualities that I could share with you, but I think you're getting my point. Sheep are totally dependent on the shepherd. Um, he has to do everything, absolutely everything for them, and they're utterly lost without him. The shepherd becomes so close to his sheep and they to him that even if they are mingled with another sheep, in another sheepfold with other sheep from a different flock or on, around a well or a stream, they will recognize his voice when he calls and they will scurry to, help, to find him. There are two kinds of sheepfolds in the ancient days. One was the kind of, was a public pen where there was a doorkeeper whose duty was to guard the door of the pen during the night and let them um, out the next day when their shepherd came to call the sheep. The other was a pen in the countryside. Usually this was a little circle of rocks piled up into to make a wall to enclose the sheep. And each pen would only have one small way in and out. The shepherd, since there was no gate, would lie across the entrance to sleep to keep the sheep in and the predators out. He would sleep there, and in this case, literally, he became the door to the sheep. Now, I recall, when I think about this often, I've recalled when we were youth pastoring and I had a large group of kids out on an overnight at a youth center in Buffalo. I was in charge of the girls, and I told them to find a spot in this large room to put their sleeping bag and go to sleep. I told them I was going to lie in the doorway and if they wanted to sneak out to see the boys, they were gonna to have to cross me and it worked. They all stayed put. I felt kind of like the shepherd of the sh and the door of the sheepfold. <clears throat> in this context, anyway, Jesus is telling us that he's not only the shepherd of the sheep, but he's also the door of the sheep. He told us that it's not like the religious leaders of that day and every day since I'm, every day since I'm afraid who desire, describe themselves or he described them as thieves and robbers. Gotquestions.org says when Jesus says I am the door, he is reiterating the fact that only through him is salvation possible. This is far removed from the ecumenical teachings popular in today's religious circles. Jesus makes it clear that any religious leader who offers salvation other than the teaching of Christ is a thief and a robber. As followers of Christ, Jesus is both our shepherd and the door to the sheepfold who provides for all our needs. Jesus is the door, the way, the approach to God. He is the only way to God. John 14, 6, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There is no other door. There's no other way we can come to God except and make peace and payment for our sinful hearts. Only through Jesus. He is the door. Jesus is our deliverer, Jehovah Mephalti. Again, Psalm 18, 2 says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is our redeemer, Isaiah 47, 4, our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, is his name, the Holy One of Israel. He is our Savior, 1 John 4, 14. We have seen and testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. What a wonderful, loving God to provide us with a wonderful, loving Savior, the door, the way to fellowship with God himself. I want to close today's study with a magnificent scripture that has meant so much to so many throughout the world and down through the centuries. Will you say it with me? John 3, 16. And we're going to add verse 17 on it too because that's important. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 
For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus is the door, the way to God. Jesus the deliverer, Jehovah Mephalti. Let's pray together. Our God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for providing this for us, for being our protector and our stronghold, for being our way to, to you. Not only did you forgive our sins, but you fill us and, and give us power to live the way we ought. And then you promise us bonuses like going to heaven to live with you eternally. God, you are so great and awesome, and we are so grateful to you. We, I pray, Lord, for these ladies who are listening today, that you will impact their lives with these thoughts, that you are our deliverer. You will deliver us from fear and from Satan and from the pestilence of this world. You are our refuge and our fortress. You are our strong tower. You are our rock. We pray this and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next time.